Welcome to WMRE's Common Area Podcast. This podcast is brought to you by the award-winning editorial staff at WMRE. Let's jump right into this week's podcast. Hello, and welcome to The Common Area with your host, David Bodemer. David, how are you? Doing, doing all right on this, doing all right on this end, given the still very fractious state of the world right now, but you know, doing the best we can. Yeah. It's like, it's almost a trick question at this point, right? I mean, how are you? I'm good, but things are burning down around me, it seems. So, uh, yeah, well, I'm glad to hear that you're doing well. I know that you have a guest on the show today. Who did you bring on? Yes, this week we have with us Belinda Schwartz, who is the chair of the real estate department with a New York law firm called Herrick Feinstein. Uh, hi, Belinda. Thank you for coming on the podcast. Hi, David. Thank you for having me. So your expertise is you, you've worked a lot in, your, in commercial real estate space. You work a lot with high net worth individuals and family offices. So I want to definitely ask a bit about that. But, but, but before we get into some of the nuts and bolts, if you just want to take a second to um, talk about yourself and your law firm for our audience, just you know, go ahead with that. Thank you. So I work at Herrick Feinstein, as you said, and Herrick is a, a law firm that's uh, based in New York. Um, however, we do deals across the country and uh, I run the real estate department and it's a very large real estate group here, over 50 lawyers, including some non-lawyers such as urban planners. And uh, the beauty of Herrick's real estate department is that we um, transact over every asset class, every type of deal, you name it, up and down the capital stack. And we're supported by a very wonderful tax department and real estate litigation department. Hopefully, I don't need them too often, but sometimes. So that gives you a very kind of like bird's eye view of the market because you're looking at the country, you're looking at all the different property types, and you're working with all like a bunch of different clients who are who are looking at commercial property. Yeah, exactly. So for example, our clients range from individual investors all the way up to institutional clients. Um, and uh, my sweet spot is I deal a lot with high net worth individuals who have, you know, their own businesses often generational. And of course, you know, family offices fall into that group. Right. So that's, that is what I wanted to, you know, just pick your brain about a bit, because we do find that to be an interesting part of the market. We know that there's a lot of capital from those types of entities, because, you know, my understanding is, you know, generally these are, they, they have a lot of investable capital, Generally, they're 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 looking to build blended portfolios, and and as part of that, they're they're going to allocate some percentage to commercial real estate. But then, how they actually approach the market is, you know, something that I'm tr that I trying to get a greater understanding of. So, as as H high net worth individual family office is saying, they want to do I don't know fifteen or twenty percent or whatever it is to commercial real estate. What are the kinds of how does that conversation take place? How does, how, how do they kind of come into the space and what are they generally looking for? Uh, that's a good question. So, uh, you know, family offices are unique, right? Because many of them have much longer uh, investment horizons than other, uh, other groups. And what I mean by that is, you know, venture, a lot of uh, private equity and funds have to deliver returns within a certain period of time right. and also have exits where they need to be taken out of deals at certain dates. And a lot of the family offices don't suffer from that. Some of them have 100-year horizons, right? So what that means is that they can go into a deal and they can, you know, they can ride the market. They don't have to sell into a bad market, for example, and they could take advantage of you know, pricing in a way that's different from other investors. And I think that's what's unique about representing family offices oftentimes. So is what's bringing that? So what is their primary goal when they're looking at real estate? Are they looking for like a long, just like long-term asset, estate planning? Is that kind of stuff top of mind as opposed to like looking at like a certain kind of IRR over a certain horizon? That's it. That's right. So I won't say they don't care about the returns, right? Because right? Right, sure. they certainly have to. Um, often they think of themselves as fiduciaries for future generations. 
Um, so while they don't want to lose the principal, they certainly would like to expand, expand the principal or the corpus and make money. And so they do look at risk returns. Um, but they're definitely focused on diversification, making sure their portfolios are built out properly, you know, looking at, you know, what you said, you know, taking, I wouldn't say they take advantage of the market, so to speak, in the exact same way as other investors. Okay. Do they have a preference for like owning physical real estate versus making place, you know, making a large placement with a fund? You know, I think the market is changing a little bit for family offices. Family offices are have become very sophisticated investors. So whereas I think a lot of them started making um, investments, well, I should I'll take that back. You know, there, there are different philosophies and some of them are comfortable investing with funds. Some of them really have the capacity to invest at the actual asset level. And, you know, to own and operate the real estate themselves. Others definitely want to invest through a fund that has a very robust track record. And they do then do quite a bit of due diligence on who they're investing with. So how, how are they sourcing the deals generally or, the, or those funds? How, how, do, how do they actually do that due diligence? Well, first of all, a lot of them have quite trophy connections, right? right? They're in that world. And my fam the family offices that I, I work with, many of the deals come to them. And uh, a lot of times it comes through their um, wealth management companies. It comes through their CIO, you know, if they have a, a lot of them have chief investment officers, a lot of them have other relationships and the deals seem to find them. That said, they, they do try to stay under the radar oftentimes. And uh, so they, they make sure that they um, have good uh, representatives who are out there sourcing really excellent deals for them. And they do quite a bit of due diligence on the deals and on the, uh, on the relationships that they might get into, um, whether they're putting out money as a co-GP or whether they're buying the asset themselves or whether they're investing in a fund indirectly into the asset. And have you seen any um, changes, like, you know, especially, I mean, we, we're, we've obviously gone through this very tumultuous uh, stretch. And, uh, you know, I think the, the narrative for commercial real estate was, you got hit pretty hard. You know, there was a lot of uncertainty at first, but then there were some clear winners and losers that emerged within the pandemic. But now we're all sort of in like this transitioning to this post pandemic period where some of the there's like a reopening play where like people may, you know, retail is is kind of coming back and hotels are more attractive and maybe even office once we hammer out what the whole hybrid slash work, work from home, all that's going to look like. So, mm -hmm. you know, within like these kind of the, this stretch of time where the the different sectors have been affected in different ways. And has that, has that kind of, has that filtered into the conversations with these types of investors in terms of the types of properties or the types of markets that, that they are, are looking at? Absolutely. In my, you know, at least in my experience, right. Um, they're looking at, you know, multifamily certainly continues to be rather strong, although cap rates are very low. So it's, you know, it's expensive. Right. Uh, they're looking at alternative investment classes, such as self-storage, um, student housing, life science. Uh, a lot of them are looking at deal, you know, public-private partnerships mm -hmm. where they can, you know, you know, partner up with maybe a, an institution, for example, a university. And of course, you know, some of them are actually investing in prop tech as well, which is new, mm -hmm. um, which and and we'll see how that turns out. You know, not not every family office is comfortable investing gener generational wealth into new asset classes, but we'll see. That's interesting. That prop tech piece of the. Um, you know, and, and by the way, yeah. yeah, right. We can go back to prop tech. I just want to add that a lot of them are putting out debt as opposed to equity. Oh, that's also that's unusual. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, those are both a couple of interesting points. So in terms of the putting, putting the debt out, so are they, well, is it, 
are they doing like mes- I mean, what kind of debt are they looking to just get so, like a little bit so, somewhere else in the capital stack that's between the equi- equity and and pure and pure debt or or how how does that work? Yeah, that's exactly right, David. I mean, they're not banks, right? So they're not not typically putting out first mortgage debt, um, but they're looking at something other than being the equity player where they may be putting out mes or preferred equity, where they might get a better return and have, you know, better return than a first mortgage lender, but slightly less return than the equity provider, but less risk. And they're seeing that as an opportunity, as a way to earn a decent return on their money without taking a lot of risk on an asset that might be might be purchased at too high a price, let's say. And is that just like a direct relationship then between these entities and you know the 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 equity investor, or are they doing that through funds? I've seen it done both ways, so I can't tell you which way is more common from mm-hmm. my personal sure. experience. I've also seen family offices invest as co-GPs, whereas they used to be, you know, the limited partnership money more often. I've seen them now, um, you know, help round out the stack on the the general partnership position um, with the sponsor. So it seems just like in general, what we're saying here is that there's a a, a bit more creativity and di- diversification, even in how these mm-hmm. entities are approaching commercial real estate than maybe they did in the past. They're awfully sophisticated, yeah. right? They're not sleepy. <laughs> and they're smart. And uh, yeah, exactly that. Yeah, I guess they wouldn't be the uh, entities they are if they were, right? <laughs> they, they wouldn't be in the position <laughs> to be called high net worth or dealing with generational wealth if they were, if they had not been pretty good at what they were doing. Yeah. And, you know, maybe I'm seeing a self selecting group, you know, New York in New York and, you know, where the money ne- isn't necessarily New York, but, you know, it's a certain type of invest, a family office that I'm seeing. And maybe they're willing to take on a little more, be more opportunistic, I should say. And do you find like from the other, from the, the, the side of things like the, the commercial real estate, you know, the pure players, how do they view? this kind of capital are they trying to work with it do they see it as competitive is it a you know a little bit of both look the the owner operators they are so eager to get connected to the family office money and as i said earlier it's typically more patient capital right so that's what people are very um you know that that's what that's what people like about it because otherwise you might be forced to exit in a, in a moment in the cycle that's not particularly good for the equity player. Right. Um, and what is the, what are the best ways for them to get, you know, if they're trying to get the attention of this kind of capital, what's the best way for them to do it? I mean, I think it's partly to make sure you have great connections with your lawyers and your accountants and your and others, you know, attend conferences, listen to podcasts, be out there, um, but also look at the deals that have been struck and see if you can figure out, you know, which family offices have been investors in them, if it's public. Um, I think that's probably a good way to do it. Yeah. So then certainly back on that, that prop tech, that was, that was sort of an interesting observation too. So that's because it is, there's a lot of capital and innovation there, but it also seems to be a bit of an unsettled space. We don't know. I mean, we, you know, some of the, some of the prop tech seems more, more certain than, than others in terms of how much it's going to be adopted and, and how it's changing the industry. So how, how does that kind of investment, is it work out? Yes, I, I have to be honest with you. I haven't seen a lot of results yet. Mm-hmm. And there are some family offices that, that think it's premature to invest in prop. And so you're right. It's a, you know, there. look, people are nervous about interest rates and inflation, et cetera, et cetera. And prop tech, if it's not throwing off, you know, returns yet is, is something that, you know, not every family office is comfortable investing it. In. However, you know, if you have multi-generational participants in your family office, 
you know, younger investors might be much more comfortable investing in prop tech and then other than and then other generational investors. And, you know, it's a balance. And, you know, given those the concerns you just identified there, like, you know, we, we are dealing with this inflation and interest rate uncertainty. Is that going to do you think that's going to ha- ha- have some impacts in how you know allocations to real estate or any any approaches to real estate in the next 12 months? I think it might, but on the other hand, you know, what investment class is protected from what's going on in this world? I don't know that, you know, people necessarily think there's a better investment class. You know, the market could go up and down too, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's more a question of a lot of the family offices don't have, they don't have to put out their money, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe it's a question of them having the ability to be a little more choosy about where they put their money in if they're investing in the real estate arena. Right. So, so they're not right. Cause they're not like a fund that says, Oh, we've raised this, we've done this raise right. and we have to place this capital, you know, a use it or lose it kind of thing. Like right. they can exactly. be more discretionary about how they do it. Mm-hmm. Those are like a lot of the questions, you know, that, that immediately came to mind. Are there things that I haven't any other kind of like idiosyncrasies or complexities about working with this kind of asset uh, kind of investor class that I haven't uh, asked you about? Well, I think um, actually, it was, you know, ESG is oh, something yeah. you might want to talk about, right, Dave? <laughs> and uh, what, you know, whether family offices are investing in ESG or what their thoughts are about that. And um, certainly it's much more of a conversation than it was a few years ago. But that's true in general in the, in, in the you know, in Wall, on Wall Street and on in, in the investment arena, right? I mean... Everyone is sort of looking to, at a minimum, check a box. And, you know, some of the family offices are very comfortable checking a box. Others are definitely, definitely want to make a difference and definitely want their capital to be invested in, you know, ESG investments that really where they've done, they do, they do more, try to do more due diligence and make sure that there isn't, that it is for real. And a lot of that is being driven by the younger generations, not exclusively, of course, but it's, it's a big thing. Climate change is a thing, mm-hmm. you know. And so how does that manifest in assessing real estate opportunities? Does that mean looking at, is there a particular part of the ES and G acronym that gets emphasized more when it comes to real estate? Is it the sustainability piece? Is it or does it also potentially mean looking at like workforce housing, affordable housing as a way to invest money to help address that issue? All of the above. All of the above. Um, yeah. Um, in, in, yes, for sure. All of the above, including if they're investing with a fund, then they want to understand what their ESG policy is as well. But other than that, there are definitely family offices that you know, want to invest in workforce housing, affordable housing, you know, look at things that maybe people didn't look at, you know, several years ago. Right. And, and I think, I mean, there's also been some effort to source capital with real estate companies that are led by women or people of color as another way of just obviously commercial real estate, as we know, is not historically the most diverse industry. So, and also just even the access to capital, capital has been, you know, limited. So is that also a way that that people are considering it? I'm so glad you brought that up, David, um, because that is so important to uh, certain of my clients. And uh, it's something that we look for in potential investment opportunities that we look for, we look for with asset managers, wealth managers, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, you know, we've got to keep, we got to keep pushing and making it better. And that's one way to do it is by using your capital to putting your capital to work with um, more diverse groups. Okay. Um, I think we've covered a lot of ground here. Do you have any 
any last thoughts that you wanted to share with, with our audience before I, I give you back your afternoon? <laughs> um, no, I just want to say I, I feel very fortunate to work with um, some very sophisticated family offices that are trying to not only make money, but change the world and in their own small way or relatively small way. And uh, it's, it's really a great conversation to be having with you, David. I appreciate the time. Well, Belinda, thank you so much for, for taking the time. Uh, I learned a lot. Uh, I appreciate you rolling with my, you know, my somewhat tangential line of questioning, but I, I feel like I, I, you know, I learned a lot just, just getting you, getting, getting your feedback on these things. Thank you so much, David. David and Belinda, this was a great podcast. Belinda, I can hear it in your voice. I can hear the energy, the joy that you find. I mean, you, you said that you love what you do, and that really comes through because I, I've heard that before where people say, oh, I love the people that I work with, so on and so forth, but it's just empty. I can tell that you find joy in this. So thank you so much for bringing that energy to the podcast today. David, of course, thank you for bringing her on the show. And our last thank you always goes to you, the listening audience. Thank you so much for tuning in and listening to the Common Area Podcast with David Bodemer. If you have not subscribed to the podcast yet, please click the subscribe now button below. This way, when David comes out with a new podcast, it'll show up directly on your listening device. This makes it really easy to share these podcasts with your colleagues. Again, thank you so much for listening today. For everyone at WMRE, this is Eric Johnson inviting you back in two weeks for all the stories that matter to you. And we'll talk to you soon. Thank you for listening to the Common Area Podcast. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guests and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of WMRE or Informa. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only.